Greg Kraska is on the MSA, SPC, FMEA, MFMEA, and Effective Problem Solving Subcommittees for the Supplier Quality Task Force that governs IATF 16949. Greg worked closely with Dr. W. Edwards Deming and is a charter member of the Greater Detroit Deming Study Group and the W. Edwards Deming Institute. He's considered one of the foremost authorities on risk management in the world. Greg, take it away. Thank you. Uh, today we're going to be talking about enterprise risk management. Um, the, uh, this is a synopsis of the session, which you should have seen as part of the uh, opening. Uh, there's information about myself, which I'm not going to be going over. But one of the things, <clears throat> reason why we are talking about risk is that even though it's been around a long time, uh, risk has started uh, picking its head out through the different standards. The ISO standards are now uh, very risk-oriented. And in fact, if you do a search of the ISO website, the terms and definitions, there's over 157 standards and guidelines that use risk. Unfortunately, they do not all use the same definitions. There are 45 unique definitions, and 21 of them are oriented only to hazards. And of these most of considered events that have negative outcomes, there are also a subset that takes a broader view of risk. Uh, they just talk about the effect of uncertainty, uh, the combination of consequences of any event that is likely uh, and an associated likelihood of its occurrence. And these are consistent with uncertain events or conditions that if occur have a positive or negative effect on the project's objectives. This last definition is also consistent with the project management organization's body of knowledge. Uh, most recently, risk has become very well known because ISO 9001 2015 has included it as a, a specific requirement in its standard. Their risk is the effect of uncertainty on an expected result. In this case, risk could either be a threat or an opportunity. So a lot of people who are familiar with the just the negative aspects have to broaden their horizon uh, to look at it from both standpoints. So, according to the standard, anything that could harm, prevent, delay, or enhance your ability to achieve your objective is a risk. So, risk-based thinking was added into the standard in 2015 as a concept, but risk management, at least with respect to ISO, 9001 is not required. Now, there are other standards that ISO uh, uh, produces, specifically ISO 31000, which does talk about risk management. And it is a very comprehensive approach towards risk management. Again, uh, 9001 2015 says you do not have to do risk management Unfortunately, it doesn't really say what is it that you have to do. So you've got to look at these other standards to get some indication of what it is that the standards are really calling for. Obviously, the question is, why are we talking about risk, period? Um, if we look at the nat national guidance on implementing ISO 3100, the one of the things on there is the purpose of managing risk 
is to increase the likelihood of organization of achieving its objectives by being in a position to manage threats in adverse situations and being ready to take advantage of opportunities that may arise. Without risk, there is no reward, there is no progress. So unless we manage risk effectively, we will not be able to get those rewards or progress. The emphasis should be on shifting from something that happened, the event, to look at the objectives. And that's the whole thing about risk management. Now, it turns out for integrated risk management, there are many different uh, types of risk. The standards saying you got to use it for everything. You got to Consider in your particular situation, are you talking about hazards? Are you talking about compliance? Are you talking about financial or even reputational risks? All of these are different types of risks that you can apply the same set of tools to. It's just that you have to overtly do it. So let's put a definition. What is enterprise? risk management. It's the coordinated effort to direct and control all activities related to risk. It defines risk as the effect of uncertainty on the objectives. And therefore, management is tied to the management of risks to that which is most important to the organization. The responsibility is and should be spread across the organization. So those who are accountable for the particular uh, events, for the particular activities, the, those who have the accountability and authority are considered the risk owners. Now, the enterprise risk management and the integrated risk management are really two sides of the same coin. Uh, managing and mitigating risk is a key part of top management's responsibility. Uh, Dr. W. Edwards Deming has often said, or often said, when he was alive, that it's management's responsibility to make predictions. And he went in to start describing on what is needed to make those predictions. Failure to understand or categorize risk in the enterprise often leads to little or no understanding of risk among the different areas in the organization, such as quality, environment, occupational health and safety, uh, functional safety, food safety, uh, at one site, let alone the multiple sites. And so what happens is that chaos uh, happens. So everybody is doing it their own particular way. Conducting risk evaluation consistently in these areas is necessary to understand, categorize, and control the organization's key risk. So we talk about the process model for organizations. And so we have the flow down of requirements. But with that flow down of requirement is a flow down of risk. Now there are some concerns. Concerns is when risk is evaluated for any particular uh, areas. We find that the same organizational process or high risk areas is evaluated multiple times. And we'll show an example of that shortly. And consequently, they'll, they're rated time after time by different groups of people within the organization. And because these areas use different terms to address the same concepts and consequently the same risks, different risk analysis approaches are typically used, resulting with a rating set very wildly. And so when we're talking about an integrated risk, enterprise risk management, what we want to do is we want to 
make that more cohesive, bring that all in together. So when we look at the concerns, concerns are different terms for the same concept, which lead to different analysis and results. So one of the things that a enterprise risk management needs to do is to understand what are the differences and what are the similarities. And so when the analysis is being done, we do one analysis for the particular area based upon the particular focus area, and we can cover it across the all the related uh, impacts. So integrated risk management says we want to use the same risk methodology process. And when we talk about risks, there are various ways people define risk. The basic is severity times occurrence. What is the impact level versus what is the probability of occurrence? So severity times occurrence. However, there is also the residual risk. Residual risks has to be defined because one aspect of my risk assessment is that if I now put into place methods to minimize the risk, what is the residual risk? And is that residual risk sufficiently low that I can live with it? And so with, with the residual risk uh, often interpreted by a calculated value called risk priority number, severity times occurrence times detection. Detection is a measure of the controls where occurrence is adjusted by the effect of prevention controls. We can then say, have we driven that risk low enough through our control mechanisms so that we do not have to continue working on it at this time. Now, the uh, if you look at ISO 31000, it does provide a structure, a framework, and the risk management process. So some of the principles they want is that if you're going to do this, it should create value for the organization. We don't want to do it just to fill out paperwork. It has to be an integral part of the organization. Management and the flow down from management has to be consistent. It needs to be part of decision making. Consequently, ISO 9001 says we have to have risk-based thinking. It has to explicitly address uncertainty. It has to be systematic, structured, and timely, based upon the best available information, takes human and cultural factors into account. That's the reason why, if we look on the right-hand side, we see the risk management says we need to establish the context. That is an integral part of the management standards that ISO is now generating. It's got to be dynamic, iterative, responsive, responsive to changes. It has to facilitate continual improvement and enhancement to the organization. So it's got to be part of the management review process. Got to look at it. Management's got to look at it at the different levels. So the framework, we designed the framework for managing risk, implement risk management, monitor review the framework, and then do continual improvement. This follows the PDCA approach that is very common within the organizations that are today. A lot of standards, for example, ISO 9001, has that as an integral part of uh, its overall structure. So the right-hand side uh, flowchart shows the overall process. 
you have to establish a context, which is a requirement as part of the management of a series approach in the ISO standards. And once we have that, then we need to do a risk assessment. And there are multiple ways of doing that. We identify the risks. We can do it using checklists. We can do it using uh, group involvement. And then once we have the identification, then we got to analyze. What is the severity of the risks? What is the occurrence of those risks? We got to use that information then to evaluate the risk priority, which ones are we going to work on first? Then we got to do the risk treatment. Once we have the treatment, then we monitor and review. Part of the risk treatment is to say, what is that residual risk? Is this treatment going to be sufficient or do I got to go back up to the analysis portion? So I will do an iterative approach. So risk analysis, the purpose is to understand the risks so you can make decisions on what is the tolerability and acceptability of the, and the most appropriate form of treatment that can be made. So we got to look at the consequences, the likelihood for the identified risks, risk events, and then take into account any presence or absence of controls. So likelihood and consequences are then combined to determine a level of risks. And these, then the causes are analyzed to determine their contribution to the frequency of likelihood. There are many different tools. Uh, this is from Appendix B of uh, 31 uh, 10. Uh, the ones that are in red are all interrelated. Uh, failure mode effects analysis is the generic uh, version of the hazard and operability standards, which are uh, used in environmental. Uh, preliminary hazard analysis, which is used in safety. Um, and then hazard analysis and critical control points, which is used uh, predominantly in food safety. All of them have the same uh, general structure. They do use different terms, terminology. They do use different columns, which then tends to confuse people. Um, I have talked to people who are in the food safety realm, and when they do the HACCP hazard analysis and critical control points, they were totally unaware that they were doing a failure mode and effects analysis because they follow just the rules that were given in the codex without understanding what was it that they were truly doing. We're going to focus on the failure mode effects analysis because we feel that it is the most effective tool. So we're looking at using the FMEA for integrated risk management. For those of you who are not familiar with the FMEA, I'm gonna just give a walkthrough of it. An FMEA usually starts with what are the functions or requirements? And that is using the quality terminology. This would be what are the, the uh, aspects, what are the uh, uh, things we're looking at if we're looking at the other standards. One of the things that we do is we start off by saying, what can go wrong? What are the malfunctions? What are the things that we will see um, within the, if we do not do the functions and requirements correctly? Once we have what can go wrong, the failure modes, we then ask, what are the causes? We need to know what are the causes because what we want to do, so we want to set up the system in order to mitigate, eliminate, or control the uh, causes of failure. So we first of all ask, how can we prevent these causes? So we look at the prevention at the one of the things that within the 
last few decades has really taken a strong stand is moving away from detection activities to prevention activities. So we ask what can be prevented? And then combining that uh, with the residual, we said how often does this occur? We're gonna be looking at the pure risk. We would look at severity times occurrence without any controls. And then when we look at the uh, residual, we would say what is the impact of the prevention controls on the occurrence? Well, we're not gonna eliminate all, so what we need to know is how can we detect if the cause or the failure mode occurs? So we set up uh, detection activities, measurement devices, monitoring devices, uh, things we wanna do in order to make sure that if it does happen, we will catch it as soon as it does occur. And to that, we quantify how good that detection activity actually is. Now, this is what you would do if the only thing you're doing is you were trying to set up a control plan for your activities. But we also want to look at risk. We want to know what is the impact. So from what can go wrong, we ask the question, how does this impact the customers. And so this would be the effects of the failure. So we look at it, what is the impact? And then we assign to it a severity. How bad is it? We could be, and uh, for the FMEAs, there is a ranking of 10 to one, 10 being the worst severity, and one being the best severity. We also use 10 to one rate, uh, index for occurrence and for detection. Now, some organizations may feel that that is too uh, definitive, and so you could drop that, and some organizations have actually done it to a four to one. Um, it all depends upon how you wanted to set this up. So then once we got the details, we said we take the severity and to that we add how it can be prevented, to look at how it can be detected and all those together come into what is the risk. What is the risk for this particular function or requirement for this particular failure mode for these particular causes? Once we get the risk, we ask, how can this be improved? And once we do the improvement, then we recalculate what is the improvement activities after, so what is the RPN, what is the severity occurrence detection after we have improved the um, uh, detection value or the prevention detection controls or the prevention controls. So it turns out that regardless of whether you are doing quality, whether you're doing environmental management, or you're doing occupational health and safety, you can actually use the same basic form. It is a little bit different than what you would normally see by looking at the HAZOP or looking at um, uh, other approaches, but we can show you how this works. For quality, if we look at the initial columns, which is the uniqueness, we see that we have the function, we have the requirements, we have the failure mode, the effects, and then the causes. So we have those as our terms in the headers. For the uh, health and safety, we have uh, the different, um, I'm sorry, the environmental, we have the activity because in the standards 14,000, they do not talk about functional requirements, they talk about activities. But as you can see, the activities 
and the functions for the steps in the process are identical. The aspects now are what is the uh, expected result of that activity, and then the failure mode is the extremes. What do we expect if we do not have good acid uh, mist, or the acid mist does not satisfy the requirements given to us either ourselves or through regulation or through the um, state uh, requirements. And then our impacts of the failure is the uh, same thing. It is what is my impact of failure, and then we have the causes of failure. To health and safety, again, we have activity conditions, which turns out to be the same, but now, instead of putting requirements, we identify potential hazards. So the hazards could be acid mist, mist and hydrogen sulfide, which is the same as for environmental, but now the effects of the failure, the harm, is different. In here, the harm deals with the environment. In here, the harm deals with humans because we're looking at health and safety. Notice that the severity is different. Severity uh, to humans is much higher than the severity uh, for corrosion to cars and houses. The regulatory violation is the same as fainting or hospitalization. And then we have the different causes, which may or may not be the same depending upon what the failure mode is. So as you can see, the, the approach, the FMEA approach is, can be used for the different requirements. What it does take is a change of view of the different um, uh, column headers, because the basic concept remains the same as we're going through. Now, one of the major difference between the different uh, approaches or different standards is the definition of the different indices. The quality index does have, in this case, 10 unique uh, categories. EMS has uh, five, and the Occupational Health and Safety also has five. Um, but they are relating to their particular disciplines. So we can put them together and we give the opportunity of the people to select which it is. Same thing on occurrence. Occurrence, depending upon whether it's quality, whether it's production oriented, or whether it's environmental, or whether it's occupational health and safety. Now these, by the way, these tables can be tailored to your particular needs. Uh, there is no universal set of tables. Different organizations may have different uh, frequencies. And detection is essentially the same regardless of cross. Do we have error prevention, which is the best? We prevent it from occurring. Error detection, we detect the error before it causes a defect. Then we have mistake proofing, which would be three and four. Then we have defect detection at the source, quantitative um, detection, post-processing. Uh, and then we go all the way through up to nine, which is not likely to detect to be things like random audits. So you need to, to determine which of these or what would be the most appropriate set of uh, tables for your particular organization. So let's take the next step once we have a well-defined uh, failure mode and effects analysis. Then the question is, okay, now how do we 
integrate it across all the organizations? How do we standardize? And one approach is to use what we call process families. Now, the integrated risk analysis benefits from using the same tool. All right, the FMEA tool starts with the process or operational steps and assess the different factors of the same process. The same team or different teams can use the same tool and the same thought process. This provides a consistency among the different risk analysis. So the benefits come when risk is understood and assessed using the process flow and the PFMEA. So we can, when we're using the same flow, it becomes clear that there is nothing extraordinary about risk analysis. We're looking at the same processes looking at different factors or different business risks. So the process flow normally seen is for quality, but if you are into lean, it uses the same process flow, it just tracks different metrics. There's more consistency in understanding and rating and evaluating risk when a format is standardized. The whole exercise was conducted to arrive at a risk number, the value using the FMEA and standard risk rating tables. It is an immense inefficiency. So we can compare then, once we do this, we can compare the quality environmental health and safety risks in one plan. But the question then comes in, how do we make sure that different plants or different entities are being consistent. Now, the approach we look at is that typically organizations have similar processes. And so we, for example, um, the plants could all have the same molding process, they could have the same laboratory. So we start asking the question, how have we rated the risk between plants? Were we consistent in rating? Did we use the same approach? Or did everybody decide on what they were going to do? Once we understand that there is a global process, types in the company, sorry about that, uh, global process, the company, we can conduct a risk analysis for an initial process and then use that same risk assessment as a basis for other processes worldwide, as long as they're following a similar process. Organizations can use this as a starting point, and if there is any disagreement in risk rating, and I assure you there will be, they can discuss this with the global champion. Uh, nowadays with web meetings, uh, with you can get people together and discuss what it is and why one group thinks it's one way, one group thinks it's another way, and so we can come up with a consistent, acceptable um, reading. Another way of leveraging this is looking at process families. Process families are a group of products that are very similar to each other, but there is some modification. We can do process families in design. We can also use process families for process. And what we use is a technique that we call inheritance. So in this case, we start off with a family level uh, process. And we detail it, we put in the information, and then when we have a new process created, we call it a child iteration. It will inherit all the different features of the parent. Now, people emulate this nowadays by, if they're using Excel, they just copy the Excel file to another file, and then they start making changes. The problem with this is that 
If one of them is changed, you don't have consistency anymore. By having a system that will allow the inheritance of the developed process requirements, you can make sure that regardless of what plant or one location, you're always going to be at the same family level. Unique requirements, that is, those things that have changed can override the family requirement. Children never follow their, their parents to the exact, so we want to be able to allow that. But we want to be able also to go back to the parent level. Of course, this can be best done by using a web-based integrated risk assessment software. There are some out there, but the one that we recommend is the one that Omnex has developed. It's called Aqua Pro. It's part of our EW QMS or IMS uh, suite of programs. And what it does is it allows you to do the overall production item and then scope it out to either environmental, health and safety, or quality, or combine them all in together. So you can see what the uh, overall system is actually doing. Now, when planning risk responses, uh, we've done up to the controls, but you want to look at the uh, control activities. If you have a negative risk, there are four different ways of doing it. You could avoid it. You can change the plan to eliminate the threat entirely, or if you're doing this on a project level, to shut down the project. You can shift risks to a third party. So we can shift the risks, for example, if you have suppliers, we could shift the risk suppliers and let them take care of it or to different areas. You can mitigate, reduce the probability or impact, or you could accept. There are some risks that we can uh, learn to live with. Uh, that's the reason why we do a risk priority number. We want to do the ones that have high risk. By the way, any risks that we come up with that have a uh, safety related or regulation related, we should take a look at that and find out is there any way we can reduce the risk even more regardless of what it is. So even if it may be considered acceptable because it's safety related or regulatory related, we should uh, at least consider is there some way we can make it even better. Positive risks. These are things people don't normally think about. We, we tend to be very negatively oriented. And so what we need to do on positive risks, we come up across something that is a positive, we should see, can we exploit it? Can we assure that the opportunity is realized? Can we enhance it? Can we increase the probability? Can we share? Can we take this information and share it across the entire organization to other plants and that? Or we can just accept it. Uh, if it's something that we accept, really, we should be looking also at sharing. It's something that we can take advantage of in one plant, we should actually take it across the entire enterprise. So risk control responses, both monitoring and review, should be planned as part of the risk management process. We need to provide the feedback to management. We need to have them take a look at it. While monitors, monitoring is continual, review can be periodic or ad hoc, depending upon what the risk level you're doing. So the responsibilities for this need to be clearly defined. We've got to have implement risk response plans. In quality, they uh, go from the FMEA to the uh, control plan 
which documents all the control activities and then provides the details for those control activities. But one thing they add for each of those is a reaction plan. Reaction plan is a risk response plan. If we identify that the risk is active, what is it that we are going to do? And it may be different for different situations. We can track identified risks, especially if they're high running risks. As we are going through our, our overall review process, we may identify some new risks. We may get feedback from the field, feedback from the customer, or feedback just from the manufacturing assembly plant um, that we could add those in. The FMEA is considered a uh, the document living information. So if we get some of that, we should update the FMEA accordingly. We need to evaluate the risk product effectiveness. If we have any risk that becomes real out in the field, we need to look at and say, did we know that risk could have occurred? The only way we can determine that is by looking at the FMEA. Either it's in the FMEA or it's not. If it's in the FMEA, well, then we could look at what did we say we're going to do to prevent it or control it, detect it. If it's not in the FMEA, then we need to say, should we have known? If it's something we should have known, then we end up with a management problem because management is responsibility, has a responsibility to assure that the FMEA is done efficiently and effectively. So we need to do this. We can do a risk audits, including project review meetings. We can look at the schedule uh, progress. We can look at the costs. Are we all within there? We need to record the risk management pro uh, process. We need to have traceability. Traceability of requirements is becoming more prevalent within the different standards and within the industries themselves. ISO 9001, when it talks about traceability, it's talking about lot control, traceability in manufacturing. But a lot of other standards which are design oriented are now talking about the traceability of requirements from the system level all the way down through the uh, process level, including all testing. So decisions concerning the creation of, rec of records should take into account the organization's need for continuous learning, the benefits of reusing information for management purposes, the costs and efforts involved, the reg regulatory, legal, and operational needs for these records, how do you access it? One of the things that I find extremely interesting, people are very good in recording lessons learned, but nobody really uses it, or very few people actually use it, access it. What is the retention period, and what is the sensitivity, and how do you control for those sensitivities? So as a summary, why integrated risk management? The value of implementing ISO 9001, 14,000, ISO 45,001, FSSC 22,000, which is food safety, um, ISO 26262, which is functional safety and electronic items, and other standards, um, is to manage the risk within the organization. Companies worldwide are implementing these standards, many times utilizing different methodologies and tools even within the same company. And the organization teams within those companies are not even talking to the, each other. There are tables for severity occurrence, and if they use it, detection are not standardized or even not consistent among the organization. Consequently, the risk numbers 
the prior prioritizations are not meaningful. They're only meaningful if the tools and methodology the standardized and the tables are standardized. So efficient risk analysis and standardization of the risk assessment takes place when the entire organization uses the same methodology and tables. So furthermore, techniques of assessment such as family of processes or product families uh, inheritance can help organizations save time by transferring the knowledge between entities within an enterprise. So integration and standardization of risk is what can be coined as enterprise risk assessment. Now, when we looked at this before, we looked at the different types of risk exposures. This is the same thing except now it indicates what are some of the standards, and this is by no means complete, relate to the different types. Hazard risks um, is environment and safety risks, but hazards are also discussed in 26262, where hazards are dealing with the driver, occupants, and people around the vehicle. It's discussed in food safety where it is looked at as being the consumer, not the users. So it goes beyond the 14,001 approach. Product realization, ISO 9001 and ISO 26262 are among those that look at the design and functional safety risks. Compliance risks, there's a whole bunch of different compliance because standards, regulatory agencies are coming with all kinds of, of requirements that we need to fulfill. Operational, again, we have overlap 9001, 26262, FSSC 22000. Strategic risks, financial risks. This is one of the things that SOX, our Baines uh, Oxley uh, requirements, is there. We can even use FMEAs for that. And reputational risk. All of the different standards can impact this category. So we do have, even though we have a uh, different standards we may be looking at, we do not just have a single, for example, environmental and safety risk for 14,000. We can have compliance risk. We can have strategic risk, we can have reputational risks. All of those things need to be considered. And same thing with ISO 9001, risk-based thinking. Cuts across all the different types of risks that we have. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And we do include in the thing, a uh, reference for sources on managing risks. And with that, thank you for paying attention. Thanks, Greg. This ends today's presentation. Thanks for listening.